Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. It's a webinar series that we have been producing for over a year and we are so very grateful to start up another season and to join you wherever you are. Thank you for coming and thank you for supporting Smithsonian Gardens with your attendance. We do appreciate uh, you wanting to learn more from our experts that we have in our own unit in Smithsonian Gardens, as well as some other people that we're bringing on board. So this year, we hope to excite you with many, uh, much more information about gardens and help you out turn your brown thumb into green. Or maybe you already have a green thumb, you want two green thumbs, uh, whatever it may be. So you know the spiel by now. Please put your questions in the chat box and we will answer them after our speaker finishes her presentation today. Our speaker really doesn't need any introduction, but I will anyway. Janet Draper is going to share beautiful images and lots of great information that she's gained throughout the years. But first she wants to know how much you know about gardening. And so I'm gonna share a poll and you can go ahead and answer what level of gardener do you consider yourself? And if I could hear you, I think I would hear you laugh at some of these choices. It's multiple choice, so you can do two or three if you'd like to. But Janet would like to know, what type of gardener are you? So it's posted. Please go ahead and start filling it out. And we will wait for a couple minutes. Uh, Janet, we really are glad to have you on board. And we're really excited that you are our kickoff for this new fall season. And I know, oh, Janet, you're going to laugh. Wait till you see some of these answers. Um, we know that there are some Janet groupies out there. And we're very appreciative uh, that you would join us uh, another session to be able to find out more of what Janet has to share with us. But there are an awful lot of master gardeners too, so that's great. So we have about 87, 88% of the people that have uh, filled things out. Not everyone has checked in yet, but we'll go ahead and start. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Look, Aww. they've been gardening for a while, but there's some new bees out there. Uh -huh. So be, be awesome. light on them, help them out a little bit. I know you will. Uh, we will put up names of the plants that Janet's going to share with us. So you'll be able to copy and paste them. Uh, and put it in. And then after awesome. the presentation, uh, we will create a, a video place for this uh, video, this webinar on our website, and we will put the resource page on that as well. So Janet, head gardener of, gardener, head horticulturist, <laughs> I should say, not gardener, of the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden, will you please share information with us of your plants and i can't believe this you don't have any passion at all so that's going to fall dead yeah but you have been it's going to be hard, persevering. hard. it's going to be very hard for you to do that but i'm going to disappear and i will come back once we're finished with the presentation so i can ask you some great questions awesome thanks cindy uh i am i'm delighted to be here it's always good to to talk plants um for those that don't know me, uh, I'm Janet Draper. I've been playing in the dirt for about 20, well, 20 plus years uh, in the Ripley Garden. And I literally am the luckiest of the Smithsonian Garden gardeners. Um, for those of you that don't know, Smithsonian Gardens, we do the landscapes and gardens around every museum on the National Mall. Plus, we have our fingers on the outposts. We do some museums that are not on the mall. We do all the orchids and the interior scapes. I mean, if there's a Smithsonian building in Washington, D.C., myself or one of our staff members, we're, we're involved in beautifying. So, and for Smithsonian, our whole goal is gathering and dissemination of information. And for those of us at Smithsonian Gardens, 
we are accredited as a museum also and we believe that the education both happens outside the museums or um, inside the museum walls and outside in the dirt so here here's a map of the national mall and uh i get a play in the dirt right here this little tiny wedge of a space um uh, it's known as the the mary livingston ripley garden and it's um again i'm the luckiest of the gardeners because of the bones of this space are just fabulous it abuts against the beautiful arts and industries building which will be opening this november for the first time in ah, nearly two decades um but the the garden is laid out with these raised planters on the north end of the garden on the the mall end of the garden and then you know and it's got beautiful uh accoutrement like this the griffin urn and the oh the fountain here is you know it's the real deal it's not a replica uh it's an authentic 1800s fountain beautiful benches got the gothic benches and then the garden meanders back um towards uh independence avenue and the planters uh recede and they go down to ground level and it just winds and it's it's a slow little pathway it it causes you to slow down and really look at what your surroundings are and i get to fill this with whatever i want because this garden is a freestanding garden it's not claimed by the arts and industries building nor is it claimed by the hirshhorn so i i don't have the parameters like um american indian museum and i see christine is on here so hi christine uh the christine's the gardener for american indian she is allowed to only use native plants from north and south america um i don't have any restrictions like that so i get a play and my goal since i i first started at smithsonian is to show people the diversity of plants that are out there that are available that can be put in your own gardens like all uh, this beautiful hellebores glenda's gloss and i try and teach about the breeding work that is being done on the hellebores to look at that foliage of glenda's gloss so even when it's not in bloom this is evergreen and it has just absolutely gorgeous foliage and so many other fantastic plants euphorbia wolfinii one of my favorites this this giant poinsettia relative which is also a member of the cacti family has these big chartreuse heads in the early spring that are just jaw dropping and you never see it being used i just adore it so again my goal is to show people plants that maybe they they've never heard of or maybe they've forgotten about it's like oh my grandma used to grow that or you know just education which also translates meaning i get a play you know this is my playground after all and i literally describe my job as i get to play in the dirt and talk to people from around the world hopefully about plants a lot of times it's about where the bathrooms are and things like that but we also get to talk plants and show them in the spring it's more than just tulips and narcissus you can also have all kinds of other things blooming at the same time um and i'm really really spoiled we have a fantastic greenhouse uh down in suitland maryland and growers that are superb that grow me whatever i request and i am so spoiled um but one of the other things I want to show people are the the Ito peonies. Um, this is peony Bartzella. And when people see a yellow peony, it's like, oh, it's a chance for me to explain about 
Hakioto Ito, who was the first person to be able to cross a herbaceous peony, one that dies back to the ground every year, like grandma used to grow, and a tree peony, the sacred big tree peony. He was able, Mr. Ito was able to cross those two to get the best of both parents in what is now known as the Ito hybrid peonies. And many people have fin done this cross now and there are amazing peonies out there, but um, they're not used nearly enough. So I wanna showcase those things and, and also showcase how it can be used. I mean, our Native American columbine, Aquilegia canadensis, just happens to bloom about the same time peony bartzella blooms. And by putting them together, you bring out that little blush of the eye color of the peony and making both even ah, better, better than they stand alone. So showing people design inspiration is one of my goals also. And showing them that they can grow their own lilies at home and showing that there are like Eucomus is from South America. South America, no, uh, uh, oh, brain freeze, brain freeze. Uh, it, it's coming from South Africa, I'm sorry, South Africa. And it's perfectly hardy for us in the DC metro area. So just exposing people to new plants, new ideas, new combinations. And things like Lilium Indian Summer. This baby, it's staggering at six feet tall. And just, just like all of us, we get better with age. And it is so profuse anymore. I've, I had to dig and divide and give away some bulbs uh, a year ago because I just had too many. Isn't that wonderful about plants? Um, so, and I want to show people that they can grow orchids outside also. This is Blatilla striata. It's uh, native to Japan, Japan and, and China. Um, it is a perfectly hardy orchid and it's just lovely. And, and I also play around, you know, remember, this is my playground. Uh, my friends at the National Arboretum had this extra uh, agave attenuata. They they had too many, and you know, so they shared with me. And I mean, so put it in the ground and create a tropical bed. Um, so every year I try and do something different and something um, that excites me, and hopefully also excites our visitor and causes them to want to come back. And we are in the middle of Washington, DC, and we have visitors year round. Well, besides COVID years, um, but we do have visitors year round. So I do try and have something beautiful to look at in the garden every single season of the year. And sometimes mother nature just puts the icing on the, on the cake and you, know, you can't top that, but I can put things out like the little hellebores that will be blooming in the winter. Um, this is from my friend Dick Tyler at Pine Knot Nursery. And this sunny yellow hellebore blooming even when the snow is on top. So there's always something to look at and hellebores fetidus. Uh, I will always stand up for fetidus because the translation of of fetid means smelly. I mean, the poor plant, it's a fabulous plant with a horrible name. So I've got to stand up for the underdog and um, do a shout out. It's a great, durable, uh, evergreen plant, blooms in the winter, uh, blooms or uh, grows under walnut trees and dry shaded conditions. It's a trooper with a really bad name. But anyway, that's my goal. But the garden hasn't always looked quite um, as, as full as it does now. Um, this, this 
this image is uh, from the early years of the garden when it was freshly made in the, it was uh, created in the late 1980s and by the early 1900s, it was kind of filling in, but it, there was a different style of public horticulture in the 90s and it was um, not mine. <laughs> Oh, my, my goal is to cram in as many plants as possible. And um, so this is what I inherited. And uh, a lot of purple leaf plums um, were here. And the repetition of the same block of tulips was there. Um, it, was, it was a style of gardening at the time. Um, and uh, I inherited this one. And I got to tell you a story about this. Um, I, before I came to Smithsonian, I was working in the uh, private gardening world. I, I was doing estate gardens. And so not a whole lot of people. And so to go from estate gardening to Smithsonian is um, woo, quite, quite the change. Um, so, this this circular bed uh, I dubbed the herb ghetto when I when I arrived because I, the previous gardeners had put only herbs in here and and like segregated them that the herbs weren't available to mingle with others and it's like eh, segregation I uh, yeah don't even get me started so my first goal was I'm gonna rip everything out here, save some, but I don't need an entire circle of toicrium um, and save certain things, but move things around into the rest of the garden. You know, herbs are good plants too. They can, they can mingle other places. And this, this visitor came and obviously she had a burr under her saddle and she was unhappy with me. And she's like, hands on the hips, you know, the whole finger wagging thing um and she's like what are you doing and I'm like hey hi I'm Janet I'm the new gardener I'm gonna you know change things up and move things around and and she stopped me dead in my tracks and she's like how am I gonna find my food my herbs for my cooking it's like Oh, so uh, reminded me uh, that some people interpret the term public uh, a little differently. Um, so anyway, I, I don't remember her coming back, uh, but this is more the vision that I had for that beautiful center uh, raised planter. Uh, there are still herbs in there. There's a bronze fennel right in the middle, and and you know there were there were still things that can be used uh, for cooking, but there's also they're intermingled with beauty, and um, so my goal is beauty. So other areas I started uh, I I started here at Smithsonian in the fall of 1997, if I can believe that, and just learning the whole paperwork system of how to order plants and that at the time it was all done by hand and you made four copies of each and and then a purchasing agent had to call the nursery and order all of this and of course the purchasing agent agent didn't know latin for latin plants and so you would hear them mangling the plant names and yeah it was a little frustrating and it took quite a while to get plants but but I still did it and within one year that same bed is looking like this um and there were so many other things that I want to show people like you know most people maybe had heard of Baptisia australis which is our our native blue indigo but at the time Baptisia purple smoke had been released onto the market and things like Carolina Moonlight was like, oh, a yellow, oh, cool, cool, cool. So many cool things that I want to show. But unfortunately, uh, I was having a big challenge with plant theft. Um, the garden is open 24 seven, there are no gates. And um, as soon as I would plant things, 
and really cool things like hellebores and baptisias, which really don't look like much when you first plant them, they were being stolen. And what really hurt, they were being stolen by someone who knew the plant. They were being stolen by one of us, a fellow gardener. And as a public gardener, you basically wear your heart on your sleeve and you, you try and show and share everything possible. And then to have them stolen, it, it hurts. It really, really hurts. And, and I knew there was no way I could um, create the garden of my dreams to show people with this happening. And so out of frustration, I, um, <laughs> I, I have these little white plastic signs um, and I was writing little notes and leaving in the holes where the, there once had been a plant that was stolen. I'd write these little notes saying, you know, to the individual who stole my hellebore, may the fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits, or I believe in karma and you got a boatload of bad coming your way. And um, I know my management team didn't like it, but um, my visitors were coming. And by now I've, I've got some people that are watching this wild, crazy woman ripping into the planting beds. And they, they read my, my notes and they, they giggle a little bit. And then, then they, they get a little upset. It's like, people are stealing? people are stealing plants from the garden. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty frustrating. Um, and those people became my security force. Um, they started watching out. And many of the people that live on Capitol Hill that would come down and this was their garden that they would use in the evening. Um, I was getting little notes saying I sat on a bench last night because there was a, some shady dude in here and uh, I stayed until they left. Um, but I knew I had rounded the corner when um, one of the homeless people I had befriended came up and told me that he stopped someone the night before stealing plants. So uh, lesson learned is you never know who or, or where your support's been going to come from. But once, once I had the, the challenges of, of uh, plant theft a little bit under control, then I could rock and roll and really get some plants going and show people and play uh, in the garden and show them plant diversity. And, you know, starting, I go through my phases just like everyone else does. You know, I've say I'm not a fashion, uh, a trend follower, but I am. Um, so I've gone through my tropical can of banana phase. And, you know, here are those little white signs that I was, I, I was mentioning that I was using. Uh, and just cramming in new plants and new plants for me, because I, I mean, I had never had a greenhouse to grow me things. And so I'm, I'm learning and playing with new things and killing a, killing a lot of plants. Um, for any newbies, you gotta kill plants before you really know plants. So don't feel like just because you've killed something, you've made a mistake or it's a learning experience. It's, it's an opportunity. Uh, so I'm playing with things. And I mean, again, to, to draw people into the garden. I'm doing a little razzmatazz out there, um, playing with things like this, Selenum ketoens. Um, it's a member of the tomato family. It's a big, bold thing, but it's a plant that says, leave me alone because it's got spines on the upper end, lower, lower side of the leaf, the, the leaves, even the fruit have spines that stop, that, um, stick in your, your fingers. I mean, this is a dangerous plant, but what it does, you know, I, I hear the, the groups of people uh, heading down to the Air and Space Museum and I'll hear the one gardener in the group going, wait, wait, let's see a garden, a garden. And, and you hear the moan from everyone else in the group. But when you have something like a spiny guy out there, suddenly, 
people in that group are going, wow, what is that? What is that? And they're, they're touching it. They're, you know, drawing back a bloody stump also, but they're engaged in plants and they've forgotten about the Air and Space Museum. So I can sort of lure them in with fun things like this. Um, and so it's all about the education, education in the garden. And it's not all the education comes from me. Um, this little guy had just met his roly his first roly poly ever. His mom had introduced him to it and his giggle will always stay with me. So it's, it's about education and, and showing people plants that they might not know. Um, I have heard so many times in the fall when this crocus speciosus, a fall blooming crocus will bloom and I'll hear people say, oh, that plant's so confused. It's blooming at the wrong time. It's like, no, the plant isn't confused. And yes, it is a crocus, but it's a fall blooming crocus. So, you know, expand the brain a little bit more that, you know, there are other crocus out there. And especially this one, uh, Crocus sativus, which produces saffron. You know, the reason saffron is the most expensive spice in the world is because this, this bulb, one bulb, blooms in the fall and produces three stamens, which are pulled with tweezers, and then they'll shrink up to be quite small. That is saffron. I, I really wonder who the first person that figured out the statements of a certain crocus were seasoning. But anyway, that's why it's so expensive. And you can grow your own saffron cheaper than you can buy saffron. So it's all about the education. So, and teaching people that senescence or death in a garden is beautiful also. I mean, we, we always hold up those like young uh, runway models that are so beautiful and everything. Well, how about as they age and, and die? I mean, there's death. Death in a garden is beautiful also. And it's very, very important. So, you know, here I'm on my, my, my horse and I'm getting so excited. And by now I've been been at the garden for about 10 years and and I'm doing cool things like the fountain is closed off during the winter uh, because you know it's water freezing close down the 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 fountain for the winter and you know I've been playing around there that's a thousand pounds of, of blue stones that I used one year I'm still finding blue blue glass in the garden occasionally um, and um, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself and I'm, you know, 10 years in and, and it's pretty precious. And then this happens. Um, 2009, um, presidential inauguration of Barack Obama. And we knew it was going to be big. And so some fencing had been put up temporary fencing to keep people out of the gardens. Um, but there were a lot of snafus and this was a historic event and people wanted to be there. And they, some little six foot fence was not going to stop them from being part of this historic event. And I totally understand that. But what happened was there were lots of snafus, you know, the purple tunnel there, you were, you had to have a ticket to get onto the mall. And there were lots of ticketing problems <coughs> and lots of backlogs. And so people found ways to get into, uh, onto the national mall. And the day after I, I did not work that day. I was sitting at home watching, watching in my jammies and, um, came in the next day and um, well, this is what the gardens look like. Um, and what I realized was uh, the little six foot fence keeping people from Independence Avenue uh, from cutting through to the National Mall, um, the fence had been breached. 
Um, but remember, there were fences on both ends of the garden, uh, walling it off. And it's really, really fortunate that no one was injured because people came in from Independence Avenue and then they couldn't get out the other end of the garden because of the fencing. And so they were hopping up into planting beds to avoid being, being trampled. And um, then for safety, the fences were opened up and they remained open for people to flood in and flood out. It was a miserably cold day. And, um, but this is what the, the garden looked like the day after. Sorry, they're a little blurry, the pictures are, because I was probably sobbing so profusely. I was uh, somewhat catatonic. Um, that had been a bed of pansies the day before, uh, gone, turned to dust. Um, things like the hellebores here that, are, that you see in 2007. Um, this was the day after the, um, the inauguration. Um, needless to say, I, I was nearly catatonic. Um, my precious, precious garden that I had worked 10 years on was ground to the dirt. And, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's no books, there's no education that can tell you how, how much a plant, how much abuse can a plant take before it, it gives up the the will to live and dies. Um, the ground was frozen solid. There really was nothing I could do except try and clean up the, the mess um, and maybe put a fresh coat of mulch on it and just hope. Um, but what I realized is as I'm walking around in my sort of catatonic state, um, my visitors and by by now, I've, I've got my regulars that come through the garden a lot. And, um, people have, you know, 10 years in. Um, these people, before when I would be working in the garden, they'd, they'd tell me how much they loved this garden and they considered it theirs and, and all of this. And I was hearing them like Charlie Brown's parents. Wah, 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 wah. It was as if I was hearing them. They were saying that because out of sympathy for me, you know, covered with dirt and sweaty and nasty and everything. Um, and I really didn't, I thought they were just being kind. Um, but these same people, when they're coming through the garden and sobbing and, and just heartbroken and, and asking me, what can they do? What, how can they help? What can they, you know, the outpouring of love and affection for this little third of an acre garden. Um, and it, it made me realize what, when they were saying they loved the garden, they meant it, they, they meant it. What I was doing mattered and they cared and it was impacting other people's lives. So what's a girl to do, um, you know? This, this, by the way, those same hellebores, you know, Mother Nature's will to live is, it's like the indomitable spirit. I mean, Mother Nature will take all the abuse we give her and yet she still tries. This juniper over on the left-hand side near the, um, near the, near the elm right there. Uh, yeah, that one's quality of life issues. It's kind of dead, but, but the others, you know, it wasn't their best uh, season of bloom, but they were alive and they were blooming. And so if the plants can do that, you know, it was time for me to pull on my big girl panties. Um, this is my, my coworker, Rick Schilling, that helps me with bigger projects. Uh, it was time for a gardener to do what a gardener does is get a shovel, stop your whining, and here... Here's an opportunity to make it better than it was before. So, um, you know, yeah, here. So, so I try again and, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still evolving. And when I, when I first started 
I was, you know, they, having the opportunity to buy tulips in the spring and oh, what colors and what, how do you choose? How do you choose? So I didn't, I didn't choose. I, I ordered them all and I plant 500 tulips or 1500 in a bed, different colors, hoping they bloom early, mid, late season, all of that. And, you know, it was a ton of work. And, and then as soon as the tulips are done, of course, you need to dig them out and, you know, just a lot of work. But I was a young gardener and I, I was enthusiastic. But after learning and seeing that, I start evolving and learning less is often more that I don't need 1500 tulips in a bed. I can have just a few tulips, but interplaced with other plants. And I think the effect is even stronger and more pleasing and more dynamic and not as much work, not as expensive. So, you know, I'm learning. Uh, we're all learning, all gardeners, you know, no one knows it all. We're always learning. We're always evolving. Um, and that's part of the joy of horticulture. And here's another example of what I'm learning, you know, less tulips uh, and maybe dramatically different colors. And then doing things like red boar kale, um, all that that's yellow in bloom is kale that has been allowed to go go into flower um and you know it's beautiful so why rip out uh, why rip things out just let them bloom let them complete their life cycle so i'm still evolving and learning and so when i was told that the beautiful arts and industries building which i absolutely adore the entire outer shell of the building was going to be restored and there would be scaffolding put around the building which meant that some of the ripley garden would be um well the the contractors had a job to do they had scaffolding that needed to go around they needed access to these areas um the Obama trampoline actually taught me that it's like, okay, let it go. You, you can rebuild. And so A AIB, um, Arts and Industries Building, um, AIB got uh, scaffolding all around and the tower crane was built inside the museum and came up through one of the, the porticos. And the in 2011, um, part of the Ripley was walled off. This fence was put up because the tower crane was flying over us. Um, but I got to know the tower crane operator, Sammy, and the whole crew that was working there and found other opportunities. Um, I was told nothing could go on the fence plants grow. <laughs> now, it became a, a new display space for me to, to put pots and, and things. Um, and it gave me more time to go up to the greenhouse. You know, um, I'm the only horticulturist in the Ripley. It's me, myself, and I. And then I often will have two fabulous volunteers that work with me. Um, they each come in one day a week. But really, I'm the entire team. Um, and so this gave me a little bit more time to, since the garden was reduced in size, to, to play with things like going vertical, a green wall. And um, it, one year I've done it in some pavivums. I've done it with uh, creeping time. I, I've tried all kinds of things, always evolving, always trying and pushing, pushing myself to see things differently but remember i told you uh i got to know the crane operator well i also got to know some of the the grunley team that was working on the arts and industries building and before they arrived i was so nervous it's like ah i'm gonna have these construction workers and the language is gonna be awful and i 
you know, all this negative. Um, well, I was so wrong. I mean, the team was an absolute love. Here's Ray and Doug, the two leads of the project. They gave me total access to the entire site. They taught me so much. They, they shared their view of the building with me. And um, they also allowed me to grow a gourd <laughs> up their vine. And I had no idea how big it would get. And I had no idea, but the construction crew, since they were up there, they would see the gourds growing. I couldn't see the gourds from the ground. And they, they would yell down and tell me, hey, it's, it's so big today. It's so big. It, I mean, it was wonderful. And just being able to see this, my beloved building that I had worked next to for so many years, see it from a different angle and a different opportunity. Um, it was absolutely fabulous. And, you know, Sammy, the tower crane operator, invited me to the top of a tower crane on the National Mall, and he was doing 360s for me. Um, you know, you got to be open to opportunities. So I am so fortunate. Um, and the ladies that grace the front of the building, these are made out of tin. They are not made out of stone. They're out of tin. And so now when I pass them, you know, I know them, what I feel more personally than I did before. So although uh, that, yes, the garden had to be destroyed, um, it was a chance for new opportunities. Um, so once once the tower crane and everything is coming down, I get to redo those areas that I had done 10 years before. By now I've got 10 years more knowledge and I'm gonna do things different because as we learn, we, we, we evolve. So I was able to, to put in Edgeworthias to show people these beautiful yellow flowers that bloom in February and March. And they're coming from the Himalaya areas. So each of them has like a warm fluffy sweater on the outside and then these little petals. I mean, these are tiny, tiny individual flowers, but the clusters of them are fabulous and the fragrance uh, because there's not very many uh, pollinators out in early spring. So, you know, because I work on the National Mall and I, I have the opportunity to reach so many people, there are some challenges. And the Women's March um, was a, another historic event where just a few friends came to town. Um, but there are things greater than me and greater than the garden. And we can fix we can fix the garden. Um, so, you know, things happen. Uh, and, but every time I get a redo, I get to try something new. Uh, trying things like uh, Pete Odoff is a very well known Dutch designer that has really um, revolutionized how some plantings are done. And it's more prairie inspired and loose and flowy and more naturalistic. So I get to do like a little prairie in the garden and show off things like Epimedium fargesii. Some people might know some Epimediums, but there are so many beautiful new ones and species out there. Uh, it's a great tough Epimediums as a whole, great tough drought tolerant shade plant, summer evergreen. Um, they bloom in early spring. Here it is with a um, red giant mustard. You know, mustards are cool. And as, as our city is warming, mustards will make it all the way through our winter in the city. We're, we're heat sink in Washington, DC. Um, for me in the Ripley Garden, it makes it through and is lovely. So I've been playing around with more incorporating vegetables and herbs into a planting bed. Here's a prism kale, which is wonderful. These are, these are edible plants. This is an edible kale. 
um, cultivars, prism. Uh, lovely, I love that blue gray crinkled texture. Apparently it's quite tasty to eat too, but please don't come grazing through the Ripley. Uh, but when, as I alluded before, when the kale blooms, it's phenomenal, it's beautiful. It adds structure and some height and some movement in early spring. And the bees just are so thankful to have an early uh, source of nectar. Wonderful plant. Um, sometimes I'll cut it back after it blooms and some of them will limp along for a while and others will reflush and put on new growth or you can just rip it out and start fresh because the older kales often will get lots of uh, white spiders, I mean, um, white fly and things like that. So it's a, it's a wonderful plant, but play around. And uh, you know, there will be challenges wherever you garden. And um, you know, mine might be a little different, but then again, I have the same challenges that you all often have, like, when our arborist Jake told me, hey, by the way, you got two American elms that are needing to come out. So this is, uh, this American elm was right at the entry of the Ripley Garden and there it's gone. Uh, this was fall of 2019, uh, the tree was taken out so all those things that were growing in the shade of the tree now are suddenly are in full sun. But I didn't lose just one. I here, this is at the south end of the garden. Uh, here's another American elm. You can tell it's needed to come out for quite a, a long time. Um, but it was an opportunity for me because what I call the fire pit is this this signage off to the right this red brick with the uh the naming of the garden oh my god 1980s fire pit just awful so it's an opportunity to redo so that came out the tree came out with the help of some of my my colleagues we were able to get the base of the fire pit out um it was anchored in there. It was there to stay. Uh, this was March 11th, 2020. Uh, and just a few days later, we were told um, COVID hit and uh, we, were, we were told to stay home. Um, so, you know, out of abundance of caution, as Dr. Fauci would say, uh, our secretary, Secretary Lonnie Bunch, has done a fabulous job during COVID to keep all of us safe. Um, he considers the staff his most precious resource that the institution has. And I'm very, very grateful for um, his looking out for me uh, and all of my coworkers. So for a gardener, from March the 23rd to the end of May, I was allowed to be on site for five days. Nothing happens in spring for a gardener. No, everything we work for, all the plantings, everything we have done, and I'm told to stay home. Uh, a public gardener without the public or a garden. And I was allowed on site for nine days for all of June. Um, but again, looking at the bright side, I am so fortunate that I love my job so much that um, there was a little stealth gardening done. And um, I went to come in and see how the garden was doing. And because the garden continued on, um, and so I would sneak in and see how it's doing and see the epimedium pink champagne and see if my thought of with the burginia ciliata, the bloom, would it bloom together? And, you know, the garden goes on. And um, yeah, uh, my, my coworkers and 
management staff did a wonderful job of uh, finding these signs, having these signs made so that we could come and work safely in the garden uh, without having to wear a mask because, you know, when it's 90 degrees and it's hot and humid in Washington, uh, wearing a mask is a, a, is a bit challenge, challenging. So we, we had these signs made, you know, please just give us some space. Um, and it was uh, very rewarding to, for so many people that were looking for something positive and something that was growing. And, you know, COVID has been very challenging and very, very stressful in many ways. Um, but I, as a gardener, was able to share and give hope. And um, it was so nice to see so many of the, the locals coming and exploring the gardens and, and exploring their world. And I thank Smithsonian for allowing me to play in the dirt and um, bring some joy and education to people. Um, the whole time, uh, you know, allowing me literally to play in the dirt. So there's still changes happening in the garden. Um, I use COVID as an opportunity to change things out because we didn't have the big busloads of tourists. So those beds where they went from shade to sun in a day, um, I was able to gut them all and replant and re-envision and redo, um, which is what a gardener does best. So whatever whatever life throws at you, you know, be be a goldfish, you know, uh, goldfish have short memories, as Ted Lasso says, and just see it as an opportunity. So I hope to see you soon in the garden. Come on down and um, see what's happening. So with that, I'll stop sharing and answer some questions. Janet, thank you. You have no passion, so forget uh, it. Not coming back, before you forget it, but thank you. That was a presentation that epitomizes one of my favorite sayings. Take chances, suffer failures, build success. Uh, and that's what you've done. It's beautiful. I try. It's I beautiful. Try. And you'll be able to see some really nice uh, um, uh, statements being made by uh, visitors. So thank you. But we have one. It's, the, the question is a multi-question, but okay. it's all uh, intermingled. So I'm going to read it to you and see how you answer. Do you create microclimates suitable for specific plants taking advantage of existing structures like walls, adding thermal mass, etc.? Do you add mulch, sand, lime, et cetera, to pe prepare different soil types and pH in the different areas of the garden? So microclimates uh, caused by weather, caused by soils, caused by all kinds of things, as you well know. Okay. Um, do I set out to create microclimates or change what I have? Usually not. I'm too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. No, I don't want to work that hard. And, and also as a public gardener, I don't think it's fair to our visitors that come and don't see the extra effort that it, I've made to be able to grow, say, a special orchid. Uh, I, want the, I want to grow things that grow in normal soil and don't need a lot of pampering. I, I don't have the patience to pamper. And if a plant is not happy growing with what I have to offer, um, there's somebody else that will be happy to grow there. Um, so, so do I manipulate the environment? No. Do I use what I have been provided? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if, uh, if there is a um, like a small clematis that I can grow on a shrub that might not have the best seasonal interest. 
absolutely, I'll use that shrub as a structure to grow something on it. Uh, but you, you have to be very careful and match the vigor of your vine to the structure of the plant that, that you're trying to grow, grow over. Um, so yeah. And I, I, right now I'm, um, our plans for what I'm doing next summer are due pretty soon. And I'm, I'm, if anyone sees me out there, I'm walking through the garden, just trying to look at the garden with fresh eyes. Um, I've been in that space now over 20 years. And after a while, you don't see the cobwebs in the corner. And trying to uh, see those cobwebs and see what I could do better, um, I'm constantly reevaluating and trying something new. And there are new plants out there too. So, um, and I'm very fortunate again with great greenhouse staff. Um, our growers are Jill and Joe. Woo! You guys rock. Um, it, you grow the best plants for us and get us started. I am so spoiled. Um, and I'm glad I'm spoiled because I get to share with so many people um, my wealth that, uh, mm -hmm. that I have. So long-winded answer. Nope, that's a great answer. It's perfect. Uh, you take advantage with what you have. You learn what you have first. Yes. Take advantage of what you have and then build upon it. That's a perfect answer. Um, another question, how often do you change the beds and do the perennials remain? So in between all the disasters, yeah. how often do you change the beds and, and what do you allow to remain? It all depends um, of my whim. <laughs> this one's <laughs> really awful, but, but if I walk by something again and again, and it doesn't, you know, and maybe I, I'm Marie kondo in here. If it doesn't <laughs> spark joy, um, you know, or, or if I think I can do something better in that area, it's out of there. Um, mm -hmm. And often it's pretty spontaneous. I'm not a planner. Some people will plan every single move. I am not. That is not how mm -hmm. I am wired. I am pretty um, spontaneous. And I am, again, very fortunate if I go up to our greenhouses and I walk around and I see something that nobody's claimed yet, or there's some extras or something like that, I might, they might make it down to, to the Ripley and um, displace someone else that isn't um, living up to par or, uh, yeah. So, so constantly, constantly editing, mm -hmm. constantly changing, but isn't that what a good gardener is supposed to be doing? Where, Definitely. you know, always we can make it better. We can make it better. I'm trying more and more native plants with an ecological bent and, and I am organic or as organic as possible, I should say. Um, I try to avoid chemicals in the garden. I have not used Roundup for years. I have a flamethrower that I do on the walkways, um, but I want to nurture life beyond the plant. So uh, there is sometimes I'm happy when I see critters chewing on things. That's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. As, as long as it's, they leave some for us too. So yes, yeah. yes. I agree. I feel that way until they start to take over my fig tree. And then I get upset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank you. And I was going to say that we do use a lot of native plants. The question was, do we promote, do we educate about that? And yes, we do. We mm -hmm. educate. Yeah. There are many of our gardens that are entirely native plants. Right. The Anacostia Community Museum, they're all native plants mm -hmm. in that garden. In the pollinator garden, they're mostly native plants. We use some annuals that are not. But what we are most concerned with, and I know Janet will echo this, we do not want any pests. We do not want any pesty plants that that take over the whole area. Oh, invasives. And, and, mm -hmm. I, I'm changing my language because okay. I, I, I'm just uh -huh. learning, being yeah. more aware of definitions. So uh -huh. a pest, yeah. I think that's what we have to consider that we don't want plants that are going to push out mm -hmm. native plants and not offer anything for our 
uh, six legged, four legged. <laughs> Do we have eight legged visitors? Eight uh, legged visitors yeah. in the garden yeah. because we want to help support the habitat. That's yeah. what our habitat exhibition is all about. And yeah. if you join us in October, Alex Denker, one of our native experts, is going to have a presentation on don't plant this, plant that, or don't plant that, plant this, whichever way we did it. So you'll see that advertised on our website. But it is one o'clock. I thank you so that much for fast. another. That was fast, wasn't it? Uh, but I thank you so much on a wonderful presentation. I always enjoy learning from you, hearing your stories, and the positive note that we end on. So thank you for allowing us to end on a positive note. And please, everyone, have fun in their gardens and play and be a goldfish. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye, all.